Uh, my name is Eloisa Mesco. I'm the uh, assistant director of the Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America. Uh, thank you so much for being here this beautiful Saturday afternoon, um, which happens to be the last day of the book fair. The book fair ends tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern time. So there is still time to shop and browse if there's something you've been looking at for the past couple of days, now is the time. Um, and you can go to the book fair by going to www abaa.org slash vbf for virtual book fair. Um, so right now I'm very excited to present to you um, Allison K. Lang, who's an associate professor of history at the Wentworth Institute of Technology. She received her PhD in history from Brandeis University. Lang's book, uh, Picturing Political Power, Images in the Women's Suffrage Movement, was published this past May by the University of Chicago Press. The book focuses on the ways that women's rights activists and their opponents use images to define gender and power during the suffrage movement. Various institutions have supported her work, including the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, Library of Congress, and American Antiquarian Society. Lang has presented her work at conferences such as the American Historical Association, Organization of American Historians, and Berkshire, uh, Berkshire Conference of Women Historians. Her writing has appeared in Inprint, The Atlantic, and The Washington Post. Uh, she also engages in public history and has worked with the National Women's History Museum and curated exhibitions for the Boston Public Library's Leventhal Maps Center. In preparation for the 2020 centennial of the 19th Amendment, she is curating exhibitions at the Massachusetts Historical Society and Harvard's Schlesinger Library. Um, and unfortunately, Theo uh, Tyson will not be able to join, so we are going to hear from Dr. Allison Lang today. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, thank you all for spending a bit of your Saturday with me today. I am going to talk today about the myths of the suffrage movement and how they got to be the way they are today. And specifically, I want us to just kind of to prime you for the rest of this conversation. Um, I want us, we're going to be thinking about the ways that um, certain items have been collected um, and prioritized over the years, certain things have been valued in relationship to uh, women's voting rights history, um, how things have been cataloged, how things have been um, assigned as in relation to suffrage and how they haven't been connected to the suffrage movement. And ultimately the main, you know, the main theme of today's chat is really about how these items whether we're thinking about books or carte de visite photographs or prints, um, how these actual artifacts really shape the narrative, the stories, the histories that we tell about the women's voting rights movement today. Um, and you know, whether that is in a history uh, you know, academic book like mine or in a documentary or in an exhibition or any of these other kind of more public facing history projects um, that hopefully you all have been seeing over the course of the last year or so. Because as you probably all know, um, 2020 is actually the 100th anniversary of the passage of the 19th Amendment. And the 19th Amendment prohibited voter discrimination based on sex. So you might come across a few uh, taglines here or there saying that the 19th Amendment guaranteed women's voting rights, and that is absolutely not true. Um, it just prohibited voting rights, uh, voter discrimination based on sex, which means that a lot of the poll taxes, literacy tests, and other discriminatory um, pieces of legislation that were passed in various states to prevent um, Black Americans from voting, to prevent Native people from voting, to prevent Mexican Americans from voting, all of those things still continue to prevent um, many women from voting even after the passage of the 19th Amendment. And so one of the things that I hope you've been noticing over the past year or so in this range of new exciting exhibitions and documentaries and you know, all kinds of programming uh, is the fact that there are a lot of people, a lot of historians um, looking beyond Susan B. Anthony, looking beyond kind of the more familiar faces of the 
suffrage movement. And what I'm going to start us off with today is actually um, thinking through how Susan B. Anthony got to the place where she is, how she became such an incredibly recognizable figure, how she became one of the few women that um, are are included in a history textbook that perhaps is read by a high schooler. Um, and so that's, that's, that's one of the main goals of our conversation. And so I'm going to go ahead and start us off with images because of course, as you can guess, I have plenty of images that I am excited to share with you today. And I wanna start us off with one of my favorite images um, of Susan B. Anthony. This is taken by the photographer Francis Benjamin Johnston, who is actually one of the earliest female professional photographers in the United States. Her mother was a journalist, pretty unusual. Um, and she actually lived in Washington, DC and started photographing political elites, right? So she photographed Theodore Roosevelt. Her mother was in these circles as a journalist. Um, and so she had a very unusual access um, as this early professional female photographer. And one of the very famous women that she photographed was Susan B. Anthony. Um, this is Susan B. Anthony in her home in Rochester, New York. Frances Benjamin Johnston actually traveled to go visit her there. And she took a series of photographs of Anthony. A lot of them look at various you know, various parts of her home. They take photographs of a table that she wrote, um, that she wrote a lot of important documents at. They show that she um, has a lot of embroidery on her walls to suggest that she is, you know, a traditional feminine kind of more domestic figure, which we know is not necessarily the, the case for Anthony. Um, but this is a photograph of her kind of doing her work. This is her sitting at her desk. And as you can see, it is, you know, covered in materials, covered in papers, covered in letters, covered in maybe the drafts of speeches, basically the equivalent to what our email inboxes and maybe, you know, desktops look like today. It's, it's covered in papers because she's in the process of a ton of work. It's also covered in portraits. We see a bunch of portraits on the wall. And, you know, I would guess that perhaps those portraits are always there. But we see a lot of portraits that are kind of, you know, posted up. So portraits that probably aren't always in those spots that maybe were put out specifically for the purposes of this portrait. And we can kind of get a sense of the kinds of women's suffragists, the kinds of fellow women's rights leaders that Anthony is associating herself with here. Um, on the wall, we have Lucretia Mott, we have Anna Howard Shaw, we have Anna Dickinson, we have Mary Wollstonecraft. Closest to her, open up on her desk, is Elizabeth Cady Stanton. We've got Frances Willard. So all of these white women's rights activists that she sees herself very much in conversation with, whose portraits that she's collected, and who she is um, proclaiming herself to be you know, a leader of a movement in relation to them. Um, uh, Frances Benjamin Johnston actually really wanted to emphasize Susan B. Anthony's profile portrait here. You see this black cloth behind Anthony, that's to really emphasize the outline of her face, which was something that really, really served to uh, signify that she is this powerful leader, right? When we think of a profile portrait, we probably think of a coin, which of course, as we all know, is one of the uh, ways that the United States government has commemorated Susan B. Anthony's work. The other reason Susan B. Anthony preferred to be in a profile portrait like this one, she most often appeared in profile, is because she had an eye issue that made her very self-conscious and so she preferred to hide it. And so this is one of the ways that she did that. Ultimately, the National American Women's Suffrage Association, which Anthony was really the head of at this time, decided to print these photographs into a calendar and sold them. They did all of this to raise money they also did all of this to really emphasize that they, they imagined Susan B. Anthony as the leader of their movement, as the founding mother of their movement, which is something that we still really think of her as today. And so when we're looking at um, some of these earlier photographs, um, we see the ways that she kind of built herself up to this over time. 
And when we're thinking about um, how this is kind of uh, translated over time, this is, we have these series of, of portraits that are distributed, whether it's this 1870 session with Stanton and Anthony, whether it's this 1881 series by, of the history of women's suffrage that features women like Stanton and Anthony, um, or if it's the kind of later um, imagery that really you know, serve to um, establish Susan B. Anthony as kind of this suffrage saint. All of this um, really is what kind of sticks with us the most today. Um, and I think that conversation has been changing over the centennial year, um, but it's still, if you want to find an image of a suffragist, it's incredibly easy still to find an image of Susan B. Anthony. And she's very much part of our popular culture right now. Earlier this summer, there was a brand new statue unveiled at Central Park. This is actually the very first statue in Central Park to actual women rather than um, literature figure, figures in literature or women uh, who represent ideas rather than individuals. And so this is one that um, perhaps you are familiar with because there was a lot of controversy over who was in it and how it was portrayed. But here we've got Sojourner Truth, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton having you know, a lively conversation, um, perhaps a competitive, you know, a challenging conversation about um, women's rights activism. And then we've got this coin of Susan B. Anthony that you might have encountered as well. And of course, these past couple of weeks, there's been a lot of news about people going to Susan B. Anthony's gravestone and actually putting their I voted stickers there. And this has become such a tradition over the past you know, five years or so that they decided to put plexiglass over her gravestone. And so she is still, you know, even in 2020, long after her death, still seen as, you know, this founding mother of the movement, as someone who um, Americans are supposed to think of as kind of a leading women's voting rights activist. And, you know, here's another example. This is from the 2017 Women's March in Washington, D.C. We've got Susan B. Anthony on this poster, um, Eleanor Roosevelt, Ruth, Ruth Bader Ginsburg beside her as well you know, really placing her in this pantheon of women's rights leaders. And unfortunately, one of the things that happens when we kind of decide that these are the people we're going to remember about a particular movement is that we lose a lot of other people who were um, at least as important as, in, as Anthony, even if they did slightly different things. So for example, um, it, we have two Bostonians on this list. Um, this is Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin. Uh, she founded the, she ultimately led to the founding of the National Association of Colored Women in 1896. She ran the Women's Era newspaper, which was really the first national paper aimed at black female reformers. Um, and of course, most famous, or, you know, the most important uh, kind of suffragist in the 1870s, perhaps that, that, we, that many of us have forgotten, Lucy Stone, who actually founded a competing organization to Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. Um, and her organization was far larger than their organization. And she also founded the Women's Journal, which was printed in Boston for many decades. Um, and that newspaper was actually far more successful, had a far broader readership than the newspaper, The Revolution, which was printed by Stanton and Anthony and really only lasted a couple of years. And then of course we have Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, who's another woman who was an author, a writer, um, delivered fantastic speeches in the 1860s particularly, um, but she's someone who really emphasized as did Ruffin, the fact that women needed to think not only about their gender and the ways that their gender was influencing their experience of politics and society as a whole, but also needed to think about race. And so one of the challenges of kind of having this wealth of Susan B. Anthony materials, this wealth of artifacts about her life is that on the one hand, they're incredibly accessible and we can use them really easily for exhibitions, for documentaries, for any range of public facing programming or um, collecting. And on the other hand, it means that the stories about the really rich, broad, diverse complexity of the movement, which is how it really was, um, often get lost. 
So I want to kind of start, go back a little bit further because I want us to get to the point where we understand why someone like Anthony did what she did. She did quite you know, an amazing thing to actually become such a powerful, influential figure. And one of the reasons why she and others did um, kind of cultivate this image of the suffrage movement is because of the overwhelming number of political cartoons that were making fun of women in politics. And I want to start us off so early because I want us to convey, to think about the ways that these foundational images, you know, from the founding era of the United States really shaped the continued images and political debates that came for many decades after. And I would argue that in some ways, these conversations about women in politics are still happening today, even if they're not happening via mezzotint, maybe they're happening via meme on Twitter, but these same kinds of themes about women who are um, ignoring their duties as mothers and wives in order to participate in politics and therefore becoming more masculine, uh, threatening the social order, which is exactly what we've got in this scene. So for example, we have this group of women here. They are all ignoring the child underneath the table. There is the only one that's paying attention to the child is this dog who's also urinating on a tea canister. Um, at the table, we have a woman holding a gavel and you know, you've seen 18th century images. This is not an idealized woman. She is not looking as feminine and beautiful as she is you know, supposed to in that era. In the background, we have a woman holding up a, a punch bowl, um, which as we know is not full of fruit punch. It is actually full of alcohol. Um, and another woman next to her is pushing that punch bowl up. So she, this is a, a drunken, rowdy scene. On the other side, we have a group of women pouring out their tea canisters um, because this group is aiming to boycott tea. They're signing this petition to boycott tea. And I do want to point out that the artist, Philip Daw, was actually a London artist who probably had never been to Edenton, North Carolina, where this is supposed to be based, probably had no intention of going. He most likely read about this petition in a newspaper and just decided to imagine what this scene of women would look like. And so these women are challenging these gender roles in society. And, in, and as a result, they're becoming more masculine. They are threatening the, you know, the, the careful balance of society. And I also want to point out this Black woman in the background behind a, the woman with the gavel who's holding an inkwell and quill. And she looks interested in signing the petition too. And the reason why she's really important is because Philip Daw and many others who are against women's rights, against women's political activism, believe that if you allowed women to challenge their social place in society, then other things would happen too. Black women might also challenge white supremacy, might also challenge the institution of slavery. And so there's this idea of creating not only something that Americans and uh, colonists, British can laugh at at this time, because that was certainly one of the goals of this, but also something that made people anxious. So this is supposed to be an amusement, but this is also supposed to be kind of a call to action to viewers to ensure that they did not have this kind of social revolution on their hands. And over time, by 1851, uh, the images are actually remaining remarkably similar. And so this is an image from uh, called Bloomerism in Practice. Um, between 1775 and 1851, a lot changes within the women's rights movement. Um, we have the rise of many more of these petitions uh, for women to have better access to education, to have access to money, to be able to own property. By 1848, we have the Seneca Falls Convention in New York. Um, and by 1850, we actually have the first national women's rights conventions happening in Worcester, Massachusetts. And so by 1851, when this is printed, Americans are really quite familiar with the growing women's rights movement, but that doesn't mean they're going to take it seriously as this print shows. You know, we've got this woman in the center who's named Mrs. Turkey. She is smoking. She has her legs crossed and um, you can tell that she's wearing bloomers rather than a traditional female dress. Even more scandalous, you can see her ankle, which, you know, as not such a, a scandalous thing in 2020, but 
1851, this was quite controversial. She has her hand placed really condescendingly on the, her husband's head. And her husband is really intended to look like an older woman who's hunched over, mending clothes, you know, doing these menial domestic tasks. This is what men will have to do if women gain political power. And of course, she's ignoring her child. Her child is crying in the front, um, saying no more papa and mama. In the background, we have two other symbols of this challenge to the social hierarchy. We have one woman who I think is intended to represent a working class woman. She says, no more basement and kitchen. And then another woman, a black woman who's smoking a pipe uh, is, is challenging slavery. And so this idea of if women win voting rights, if women win political power, then the class and racial hierarchy is also under attack um, is hasn't changed, hadn't changed very much by 1851. And so this is a similar image from 1869, not that much later, but this is about a century after that first image we looked at. And I want to point this one out because it is um, kind of representative of the fact that either way, women can't win. Um, women are wearing bloomers in this image, which you know, women's rights activists had long given up bloomers by 1869. Um, but, and wearing top hats, they're smoking, they're doing all these masculine things. But even the women who are wearing more traditionally feminine attire, uh, dresses are actually wearing uh, really outlandish costumes. Their skirts are really bizarre, even for 1869. Their bows are enormous. Their hair is incredibly large and heavy. And these styles are just um, intended to make you laugh, whether you're laughing at them for wearing very masculine clothes or you're laughing at them for wearing very feminine clothes. Um, I love this central detail, vote for the celebrated man tamer, Susan Sharptongue. I think that, you know, in some ways we see that kind of commentary in the media about female political leaders even today. Um, in this other image on the side, we have this woman shaking her fist um, at a man who is presumably her husband, and she's telling him that she needs to go vote. He needs to take care of the child, and he is incredibly appalled that this is happening to him. And so, as you know, by 1869, this is this post-Civil War period, Americans are debating who should have the right to vote. Should newly freed people have the right to vote? And ultimately, they do decide yes um, and pass the 15th Amendment, which prohibits voter discrimination based on race and effectively enfranchises newly freed Black men. And so this is, um, in 1869, this is really a moment where people are, Americans are really rethinking what their democracy should look like. And it's also the year that women in Wyoming territory win the right to vote. And so this is starting to feel more possible, feel more like these, these women might actually be going somewhere. But the images that we're looking at, uh, these political cartoons don't change much. In some ways, they just get more specific over time. So when it, this is an example of Thomas Wust, um, the woman who dared. And we can tell by 1873 that this is specifically recognizable as Susan B. Anthony. Um, she has her hand on her hip. She has an umbrella in her hand. Her skirt is far too short. If you look closely at her boots, there are actually spurs on her boots too. Um, and this very much is a, is a reference to a photograph from 1870, a carte de visite photograph. So these very small photographs that were very inexpensive and sold cheaply and easily, um, not only in New York City studios, but also mailed throughout the United States. The expectation that this artist has is that you, the viewer, will immediately be able to recognize that this image is of Susan B. Anthony. It does not say Susan B. Anthony's name in the title beneath it, but she is representing all of these threats that, that Americans are very much afraid of. Um, we have a police woman on one side, we have a political rally of women in the background, and we may be used to women protesting in the streets today in the 21st century, but very much not something that suffragists were doing in 1873. And we've also got yet again, this sign of the end of the world, a man holding a baby and another man carrying groceries. 
And so this, this continued challenge, um, this expectation that um, these women are challenging all of these traditional family values, these social norms. And this artist actually even took it to another level by showing the viewer, by showing the, the viewer us in a close up of what Anthony's eye issue looked like. Um, she had one eye that didn't often focus properly. And he actually decided to reproduce here, reproduce that here, which was really intensely personal, um, a cruel act, I think. So I want to think about, and this is jumping back a little bit, but I want to think about how women have shaped their own images. So Anthony in these cartoons, this is clearly a narrative against women's rights activism, but actually one of the first women whose portrait was part of her work in the United States was Phyllis Wheatley. Um, and she was uh, a, an enslaved woman in Boston and she um, was able to write and eventually publish with the help of her owners, uh, this small volume of uh, poems in 1773. And so she not only was able to publish her text, she was also able to shape the representation of herself because in 1773, many Americans and many colonists, you know, British colonists at that time, um, many could not imagine a black woman writing anything intellectual like this. And so the photograph, the portrait rather, is really there to help its readers envision a world in which an enslaved black, black woman can write these amazing texts. And so this is one of the kind of first um, image making projects that a woman in um, America is, is undergoing at this time. And so I think it's really valuable for us to kind of think back to these earlier times because at, in 1773, there aren't that many women's portraits distributed, circulating publicly. There are very few. And so Phyllis Wheatley's portrait is one that really stands out to us today because it's one of the really unusual examples that we have. And Frederick Douglass, you know, perhaps looking back at someone like Phyllis Wheatley's portrait, is someone who kind of in the in the early 20 in the early 19th century, especially after he escapes enslavement, realizes that photographs are the next thing that can take the way that we represent ourselves to a new level. Um, scholars actually believe that he is the one of the most photographed Americans in the United States which is an incredible feat. He has his portrait taken all over all the time. Um, and he is trying to convince viewers, convince Americans that black people like himself are these respectable, dignified people in order to challenge the racist stereotypes, the cartoons um, that are so widely distributed throughout the 19th and into the 20th and perhaps even into the 21st century. And so Frederick Douglass is, um, is a great example who uh, of a person who really sees the potential in particular of photographs because they seem even more realistic and lifelike than something like an engraving even a, a, a very kind and uh, a pretty you know positive engraving of Phyllis Wheatley um, that we were just looking at and so certain our truth is um, she very much is part of the same circles that Frederick Douglass is. She very well may have attended or heard about his talks. He gave several lectures on pictures and progress, thinking about the ways that images can challenge social norms. And very soon after Frederick Douglass decides to sit for photographs, sit specifically for carte de visite photographs, um, and sell them, um, Sojourner Truth does the same. Um, so this is a photograph from 1864. We see Sojourner Truth um, in this carte visite seated. She is surrounded by kind of the trappings of domesticity. So she has in her hand knitting um, on the table. There's this lovely tablecloth as well as a vase of flowers um, and, a, and a book. And so all of these things are trying to suggest that she is basically in kind of like a parlor like setting. She's wearing very simple clothes for you know, 19th century standards, they're very simple clothes and this head wrap um, to suggest that she is a respectable woman. She's not a frivolous woman. And she has this text at the bottom that gives you a sense of her purpose here. It says, I sell the shadow 
to support the substance. And as you all probably know, a shadow was a very popular term for 19th century photographs because this is the moment when people are literally using sunlight to create these photographs. So she's selling this shadow, this photograph, to support the substance, which is herself, you know, her physical self. She's a professional reformer, but she's also trying to support the substantial reforms that she wants to see happening, right? So these reforms against slavery, in favor of civil rights, in favor of women's rights, all of these things are what um, uh, she's, she's putting money and in her time and her resources into these kinds of um, equal rights movements. And you can see in 1864 that uh, in 1860, she takes several of these portraits, all kind of similarly themed. Um, you can see that um, this probably inspired Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton to actually sit for their portrait in Napoleon Serenity's studio in 1870. This is the first photograph that they really took together and they had the public in mind when they took it. And we know that Sereny sold this portrait to the public because we have very different, um, card, we have various different card to visit backing cards that show his different addresses over the years. So this is something that that was regularly of interest to the public as well. But you can see that these portraits, in some ways, the the emotions that the people in the portraits are um, sharing with us are very different. On the one hand, we've got Sojourner Truth looking very dignified, refined, elegant. On the other hand, we've got Anthony and Stanton who look like they are aggressively ready to lead this women's rights movement. You know, they have this privilege as white women, they don't have to kind of perform the same level of domesticity and dignity that Sojourner Truth does. And so Elizabeth Cady Stanton here is, you know, leaning against the table next to a book um, she looks like she is ready to defy anything that you're about to say. You know, she and Anthony have just started their first suffrage association. They've just started their newspaper called The Revolution. Um, and Anthony looks like she is, is, is also eager to, to lead this fight. Um, and so they are very much inspired by um, Sojourner Truth's portrait and her effort to kind of challenge these stereotypes about women in power. And one of the first major projects of women's of the of that they kind of embark upon is this History of Women's Suffrage series, which is ultimately a six volume series edited by Anthony Stanton and another suffragist named Matilda Jocelyn Gage. And they really tried to emphasize, they included a range of portraits in here, and they really tried to emphasize that they were these, you know, political leaders, that they could be look like presidents, right? And so they also selected who would be included in that series too. And although Anthony for sure had a portrait of Sojourner Truth with her, she actually chose to exclude all women of color from this, uh, from portraits in this series. She also decided to largely ignore Lucy Stone and the American Women's Suffrage Association in this series. She also didn't include any portraits of men, of male suffragists in the movement. And, you know, if you know, from the 19th century, men are the voters, are the overwhelming majority of voters at this time. They are the ones who are holding office. They are, in fact, you know, donating money to suffrage associations. They are, in some cases, leadership positions in suffrage associations. So they are playing incredible roles as allies and supporters of the suffrage movement. But you would not know that if you are just looking to see who the important people were in the movement in the history of women's suffrage. They're really trying to look like these political figures, right? So this political presidential campaign, this is the kind of images that we really still encounter today, whether it's in a museum, maybe it's on a university campus, maybe it is, um, you know, uh, portraits of a, of, of a new president. Um, these are the kinds of images of white male political power that are still very much part of the American political culture today. Um, but Anthony and Stanton are, are really trying hard to kind of prom to, to refine their public image. And Susan B. Anthony is really the one who's most focused on it, but she does it on behalf of herself and Stanton. And this is actually a portrait, a, a, a series of portraits that Anthony was really concerned about. She hated this particular one. And she actually wrote 
to the Cincinnati Commercial Gazette um, from her office. She, then she was in Washington, D.C. at the time. And she asked them if they would be, be so kind as to destroy this engraving plate. Because as you know, one of the common practices in the 19th century was to share these engraving plates with other people so that with other newspapers so that people wouldn't have to invest in creating a new engraving plate um, and this would reduce costs. And so she was really angry. She didn't like the way that Anthony and Stanton were being portrayed here. And so I, I suggest this to give you a sense of the fact that the um, that Anthony had a very particular idea of how she wanted herself to be portrayed and how she therefore wanted the rest of the movement to be portrayed as well. And so by the time we get to 1900, we have her seated at this desk. She's not only seated with, you know, other portraits of women who she looks up to. She is seated with the portraits of women that she is claiming as the important people of the suffrage movement. And a lot of these portraits are the kinds of portraits that we have the easiest access to today, you know, because they were validated by being reproduced in books like the history of women's suffrage or because, you know, Anthony made sure that these women's portraits were the ones that were distributed through things like her newspaper um, or through the suffrage organizations that she led. You know, she really helped decide who the important people in this movement were. And of course, we see this shift um, and, you know, there's this emphasis on the ways that women are, suffragists are these, you know, um, elegant women in the early 20th century. There's a shift away from emphasizing them as political leaders and a shift toward emphasizing that they are these fashionable elite white women, very much similar to the Gibson girl. Uh, design, but this really serves to, um, this doesn't really change this anti-women's rights narrative. Um, they just decide to reinvent uh, anti-women's rights uh, imagery to reflect that they are now making fun of women in much more fashionable clothes instead of bloomers. This is how can she vote when the fashions are so wide and the voting booths are so narrow. And this is one example. One of the exciting things about um, some collections, um, there's far less uh, anti-women's rights imagery, materials, um, collections as a whole that we find in archives. But the Massachusetts Historical Society is one that has like quite a rich collection of that. Um, and we see the ways that anti-suffragists, which um, women were the first anti-suffragists, uh, you know, they founded their first anti-suffrage organization in 1895 in Massachusetts. Um, and they are challenging the suffragists by the early 20th century. So we, on the one hand, we have the suffragists who are emphasizing that they are the ideal fashionable uh, white women of that period. And on the other hand, we have the anti-suffragists who are emphasizing essentially that they are the same, right? That they are the more feminine, more fashionable ones um, in the early 20th century as well. So it's very much in competition with each other very different from the kind of images of political power that Susan B. Anthony was advocating for earlier. And there's also an emphasis on motherhood. This is by Blanche Ames, and it really emphasizes that this particular suffragist who is surrounded by her three children in this very much idealized home with the God bless our home sign and everything, this is an emphasis on, you know, women need the vote not only because they are um, women, um, but in fact, uh, in order to become better mothers. So they will not abandon their roles as mothers and wives, and they won't be challenging this hierarchy, this gender hierarchy. They will in fact be um, improving it and reinforcing it. And so we have some, uh, some anti-women's rights cartoons like this one by a woman named Laura Foster, who is a professional artist. Um, and as women got closer to fame, uh, they are also experiencing more loneliness, anxiety, strife, suffrage, and they were abandoning their ch children at the bottom of these steps, um, which included, uh, you know, ideas like love, marriage, children, ambition, etc. Um, so this is this is very much um, in conversation with each other. And we also have these anti-suffragists emphasizing that um, women are not 
going to lean into the home more if they win the right to vote. They're going to abandon their children and their families more with this kind of imagery from the Massachusetts Association that opposed to the further extension of suffrage. From the 1910s, we have this father coming home. There's a votes for women sign on the wall. Um, and she's supposedly going to become uh, be home back this evening, but her ch children are incredibly sad about that. And all of this really ignores the diversity of the movement. We've got Mary Church Terrell, who's the first president of the National Association of Colored Women, which was founded in 1896. And she does a lot of work to try and get um, Americans to recognize that Black women are um, dignified, respectable, refined, and even elegant figures. She's a fairly well-off woman. She's one of the first Black women to actually complete an undergraduate degree in the United States. Um, and she's really trying to become a public face uh, for Black women's rights activists. But I do want to point out that she doesn't have the same level of resources um, both organizational resources, but also what financial resources um, that white suffragists have. So she's really doing this very much on her own. So we have this image of her from one of her bulletins, and you can see that it's very similar to this idealized image of the new Negro woman from the, around the same time period. So there's this emphasis on um, creating and promoting this new ideal um, Black woman at the time. And I do want to give you an example of one of the rare items that I encountered um, that, that I think really illustrates just, you know, how, um, uh, how much this is, this is an incredibly unusual image because it shows a Black woman who needs the vote. Um, none of the National American Women's Suffrage Association or National Women's Party organizations, both led by white women, really were emphasizing that Black women need the vote uh, because they're a mother, they actually really weren't including Black women in their propaganda. And so this is one of the few images that I ever came across in my many years of research that really emphasized that Black women need the vote. It was um, printed by the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And it shows a woman who has a bat labeled the federal constitution who is protecting her children um, by beating down segregation, Jim Crow laws, and grandfather clauses. And so while a lot of the images I've shown you today are, are more common, more accessible, um, this is one that's really remarkable and really unusual. And so as we kind of close out this conversation, um, I want us to think about the ways that our, our collecting practices, you know, what we decide is important, whether we're an individual or as an institution, you know, the items that we think are important, um, how that shapes the stories that we tell, you know, how when we are cataloging things, how labeling someone like um, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin, a civil rights activist versus a suffragist versus an anti-lynching activist versus a journalist who was all of these things. But if that doesn't appear in the catalog record, it's, it's very easy for her to kind of slip through the cat cracks and not be identified as a suffragist. How all of these things um, really shape the stories that we tell and they really shape um, the ways that um, we remember the, the, this movement and it tells us, uh, it shapes the, what we decide is significant for this movement today because what we know now that um, perhaps wasn't as clear in earlier commemorations of the 19th amendment is that this voting rights conversation is continuing today and that the 19th amendment was just one uh, one important milestone in that conversation about women's voting rights and when we look at this broader story beyond Susan B. Anthony we can see that women like Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin and Frances Ellen Watkins Harper are very much the forerunners to women like Fannie Lou Hamer and Shirley Chisholm and other Black women who are fighting for civil rights and, and political voices um, later in the 20th century. So if you're interested in finding out more about my book, uh, this is, it's called Picturing Political Power, and there is a code for 20% off, um, but you do have to purchase it through the University of Chicago Press website um, with the code UCPNEW. Um, and I'm excited to answer any and all questions that you have about this about this topic. Thank you so much, Allison. This was so incredible. We have one question in the Q&A so far. Um, did Anthony register as a Republican? Can you address the views of the major political parties toward the right to vote for women? Was the Republican Party more receptive 
or no, meaning uh, for Anthony registering as a Republican? So that's a great question. And it really depends on the year. It really changed over time quite significantly. Um, certainly, uh, so Anthony actually registers to vote and she votes in the 1872 election. And I'm guessing that this is exactly the election that this um, question asker is thinking about because she does vote for the Republican candidate Grant in that election. Um, and she, one thing to note about the Republican Party in the 1870s, and as a historian, you know, in my mind, these parties have changed so much over time. Um, institutionally, they are technically the same, but it, as a historian, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to divorce them from this very different historical context. At, the, at that time, in the 1870s and 1860s, Republicans um, were very much the party of anti-slavery, um, very much the party that is most interested and, and most curious about women's rights activism. Um, and so by the 1860s, Anthony is very much um, in, in communication with many other Republican uh, leaders, re many other Republican political figures. And so at that moment, um, she is uh, definitely, she decides to vote for Grant. Ultimately, that particular vote um, doesn't really count much. She's able to actually cast the ballot, but she does go to trial for casting that ballot because she wasn't supposed to. Um, and she is um, ultimately ordered to pay a fine. Um, but the the cartoon that I showed about midway through the presentation of her with this umbrella, with this scene behind her of the political rally, that is one response to her trial. Um, people really thought of her um, as a joke. And so I think one of the things that we should be impressed by Anthony about is how she goes from in the 19th century being a representative of a joke, of a, a, a mannish, radical, revolutionary woman to in the 21st century in many ways being identified as a feminist hero. This is a major transition that she's able to uh, coordinate, honestly, a lot on her own. Wonderful. Um, someone wants to know, why no mention of Ida B. Wells Barnett, a notable voice in women's suffrage? Yes, uh, Ivy Wells Barnett is another fantastic character. I wish I could mention all my favorite suffragists. Um, this is, uh, but she's a good example. She and Mary Church Terrell actually uh, knew each other quite well. Um, they grew up in the same area. And, uh, but they also disagreed on a lot. Um, so one reason I focused on Mary Church Terrell here is because Terrell in particular um, was incredibly focused on uh, her uh, visual representations of herself and distributing those visual representations of herself widely. Um, that's not to say that Ida B. Wells didn't distribute her portraits, um, but she was less, less focused on it um, than Terrell was. But um, yeah, I hi highly recommend, uh, uh, highly support <laughs> all Ida B. Wells commentary. <laughs> Wonderful. How would you recommend that catalogers and archivists work to remedy the problems with inadequate cataloging of images and ephemera? I think this is a really tough, uh, enormous project. Um, you know, I came to this, this project um, not realizing how much calling up a women's rights collection at a prestigious research library, how limited that would be and how much it would be shaped by a librarian or curator's um, comments from whenever the uh, collection was uh, you know, brought into the archive. And so I think that it does require quite literally going back into these records and um, changing these tags. And I think that that's an incredible incredible amount of work um, because it, it, it's, it's in some ways, uh, it's in some ways requires a lot of thought, a lot of thoughtful consideration about, you know, okay, Ida B. Wells, she's an anti-lynching activist, she's a journalist, she's a women's rights activist, she's a civil rights activist, you know, all of these incredible things. Um, but then it also requires just the logistical work of like, this literally needs to be put in all these entries. Um, but I think that it is, incredibly valuable. It, it, um, 
lowers the barrier to um, especially new scholars or people less familiar with the material to actually be able to tell these richer, more diverse stories. Um, because otherwise it's, it, it can be really hard to know what you're not finding if you don't know where to look. Excellent. It's fascinating to see the idea of motherhood used both, both for and against suffragists. Do we have record of extreme suffragists who wanted to abandon motherhood altogether, or was that only a caricature? That's a fantastic question. I think that uh, the viewpoint would depend on who who's answering. I think that some people would say that someone like Susan B. Anthony was challenging this idea of being a mother, um, that she because she never married, she never had children. Um, and we do have records of her having very intimate relationships with other women. Um, we know that she reprimanded Elizabeth Cady Stanton, her very close friend, when she kept getting pregnant um, because she thought that her actor, she was needed uh, as, a, as an activist in the movement even more. Um, so I think some people might say, well, Susan B. Anthony herself is this challenge to expectations for women as wives as, and mothers. Um, and yet we also know that um, she certainly would not have accomplished a lot of the things that she did um, if she had decided to adopt those roles. Uh, and I think it's very possible um, that uh, she, she didn't want that the, uh, the, the responsibility of wife and motherhood. It's also possible um, we're getting some brand new research out by another scholar named Wendy Rouse on the sexuality of suffragists. And I'm hoping we'll maybe even have um, some more insights into how she felt about her own sexuality. What, what is the imagery like after the passage of the 19th Amendment? Well, everything changes after the passage of the 19th Amendment. One of the, one of the fascinating things about looking at um, activism over several generations is that it seems like every kind of generation rejects what the previous generation did, right? So we have, you know, this early generation of Susan B. Anthony and, you know, emphasizing these portraits and uh, these, these powerful images of women as political leaders. And then the next kind of generation emphasizes that these suffragists are very fashionable, very pretty uh, figures um, in, the, in the decades that follow. And then by the 1920s, um, you know, women are increasingly rejecting this idea of being just a wife and mother. Um, so this is, I think that what we see is just this constant reinvention. Um, and yet, I would also still say that a lot of the themes that um, are from these earlier images about women having to be feminine, motherly, caregivers, um, a lot of those kinds of themes and expectations for women um, are still there when we're looking at images of women in public leadership positions, even in 2020. Um, when we're thinking about Kamala Harris, our vice president elect who introduced herself when she was nominated as Mamala, um, you know, this emphasis on caregiving despite the fact that she actually has no biological children. This is something that is still um, valuable to her, Amy Coney Barrett, when she was in her uh, 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 hearings to become the new Supreme Court justice. There was a, an incredible amount of conversation about her um, abilities as a mother, um, which we wouldn't see in conversations about men. And so this is something that we're still grappling with <laughs> hundred years after the passage of this amendment. Yes, we are. Uh, we have a, this is from Maria Daniels. We have a version of the Sojourner Truth image at the Athenaeum. It's part of Theo Tyson's anti-suffrage online exhibition. How do you choose which version of an image to work with? That's a, a really good question. And, you know, for publication purposes and for Zoom recording purposes and a lot of things like that, I try and use images that I know I don't need to ask for rights to, that I, that I can access and use freely without um, too many people getting angry. So that's, um, you know, open access is actually a, a major, um, uh, a major thing that defines which images I even used in my book. Um, it also look for um, images that are a little bit higher quality, ideally. Um, and as far as just choosing in general which images I use, I look for images that are representative of the many, many other ones I'm encountering. So there are um, a lot of Sojourner Truth portraits that look 
very similar to the one I used. There are a couple of outliers. There's one where she has a, a portrait of her grandchild in her lap. And, you know, so I tried to choose one also that's, that's representative of the greater majority of ones that I've seen too. Wonderful. We have one last question in the Q&A, unless any others pop up. Um, like the Second World War had an influence on women in the workforce, did the First World War influence women's fight for the right to vote? It definitely did. I would say a combination of the First World War, which is when a lot of suffragists joined up as nurses, um, joined up as factory workers, as farmers, um, all kinds of activities activities were really vital during the First World War. In, that in combination actually with the flu pandemic, I'm starting to think um, was perhaps really vital. So one of the things that suffragists emphasized is that women would be even better caregivers if they were given the right to vote, if they had the right to vote. And so it's hard. So I think that the combination of their um, support during World War I and then the, you know, this, this mobilization of female nurses, um, not only in a professional setting, but also as caregivers in their homes and communities. Um, it, it's, it, it doesn't seem like a surprise to me that then in early spring of 1919, when the flu pandemic is winding down, um, they, the Congress realizes that these women are you know, vital components of their society. So I think that I think that actually it's a combination. I think that hopefully in another you know, few years, we'll have some fantastic book analyzing the suffrage movement in the 1918 pandemic that maybe we wouldn't have thought of before this particular moment. Amazing. Thank you so much for presenting today and for showing all these incredible images and sharing all of this knowledge with us. Um, Thank you don't so much for hosting me. Yeah, of course. Don't forget to visit the fair. There's still